with fellows Joanne McEachin and Yvonne Hutchinson. In this fireside chat, Joanne will interview Yvonne and guide the discussion which is dear to my heart on reimagining workplace learning. Unpacking workplace learning as a means through which we can also learn to be better, more inclusive humans. Joanne is from Waitaha, Naitama Moya in Naitahu descent and has spent over 30 years working as a teacher, principal, superintendent and education change leader in countries around the world. She's a celebrated author, speaker, change leader and executive coach. She's also the CEO and founder of the Learner First. Education is learning who you are, how you fit in and how you can contribute to humanity. Just a little bit about EHF for the first time as to one of our conversations. Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of over 500 entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creators, and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. These live sessions are informal conversations between the fellows and the New Zealand ecosystem, so you can get to know them and what they bring to New Zealand and are often the start of an ongoing conversation through to action. We'll be having about a 30, 40 minute discussion, depending on how deep it goes, and then moving into Q&A and the discussion with you all during this next 60 minutes. Just a little bit of housekeeping, it is recorded and it will be up on the uh, website if you wish to watch the recording afterwards and stay muted or raise your hand if you wish to raise a question, but we'll probably leave the questions to nearer the end. And if you have to leave, that is okay too. Over to you, Joanne. Oh, tēnā koutou, um, um, Shalyn, thank you so much. Um, no mai haere mai, ko Joanne McKeegan tuku e ngoa, ko nai tahu te iwi. It's just so lovely to be here today and thank you so much for giving us this honour of being able to have a chat today. And welcome, it's a huge welcome to Yvonne today. We are so honoured to have you with us. Um, she's a colleague from um, EHF in Los Angeles and I'm sitting here this morning in Ōtātahi Tiwai Pūnamu and it's a brisk autumn day here this morning and no doubt a lovely spring day for you Waimon over in Los Angeles. So I'd just like to take a moment to introduce this most incredible beautiful person we have with us today. So Iwan is one of these people that believes in solving big problems and she likes to use toolkits to do so and that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy talking with her. She loves to use interdisciplinary approaches to solve these complex problems because she understands that we're whole people and that we can't do things in silos. She likes to build bridges between different research and practice and knows that that's the way that we work together. Before she started her um, company Ready Set, she worked as an international labour and human rights lawyer for nearly a decade. So she's really steeped in how to work with humanity and with people. She's worked with the with foreign national governments and the US Department of State and with the UN, a group that's working really hard to change our world. She's a member of Harvard's Law Institute for Global Law and Policy Network. She's an expert on labor relations and diversity in the workplace. And Yvonne has presented on diversity, inclusion and labor issues at Lord Harvard Law, MIT Sloan and UC Berkeley, as well as conferences all over the globe. She holds her doctorate as a JD from the law, Harvard Law School, but her favourite pastimes are baking pie, playing with her puppy and travelling and watching unfortunate action movies. So I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit more about her as we go through. This is a little bit about her company. So Ready Set is a consulting and a strategy firm that helps companies build more human-centric and inclusive cultures. And I think that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today because that's, that's what it's all about. It's about that human-to-human -human relationship and how do we change our workplaces to become places where we all want to work and to be together and make a difference for all of the people that we're working with. This isn't about the tech part of it, it's about the human part of it, but how do we include the way of working together. But our clients are including people from technology, from entertainment, from nonprofits, from social change organisations, and each of them are starting at a unique point in their own on their own DEI um, journey. And that's diversity, equity, and inclusion, just to make sure we're all speaking from the same language. Mm. So welcome, my friend. It's a real honor to have you here today with us. And I'm really excited about this conversation. Yvonne and I have had a couple of conversations before we started this journey together. And this is the beginning of a lot of conversations with us. And I hope that today you are going to really enjoy our conversation as much as I've started to as well. One of the things I loved when I looked on the website was everyone said, we put people first. And I think that's the most exciting thing. So I'm just going to say, tell us a little bit about more about you as a person and how did you come up with that, Yvonne? 
Yeah, thank you so much for um, that wonderful introduction, first of all. And um, I'm really excited for this dialogue. And I'm also super excited to see some familiar faces in the chat. So I'm really excited for the discussion uh, portion of this as well. Um, but how did I get into this work? I think for me, it's, um, you know, I always say there's like the official story I tell and then the unofficial story. So I'm going to do a little bit. We're an intimate company. I'm going to do a little bit of both today. Um, you know, the official story I tell is that I so I spend my my early career as an international human rights lawyer working in conflict zones. My first job was in Afghanistan and I was working with um, the ministries really to, to figure out what their capacities were and to think through uh, questions like aid effectiveness, right? Like how do we make the most of our resources for the people that are on the ground and what are we doing that's really working and what's not? Um, and for a really long time in my career, uh, I would say the majority of it as a human rights lawyer, I tended to think of violence kind of in those terms as something that was exceptional, as something that happened in times of conflict, as a space in which an outsider could come in and like spread the gospel of peace and democracy and fix everything. And um, as my career progressed, I slowly left those situations and started working in more protracted human rights um, emergencies. And my last job was in Nicaragua, working with sugarcane workers who were dying of occupational disease. And what I saw there, the scale of the violence was horrific, right? Like, I like to say that in the town I was working in, you know, you couldn't get lunch after one o'clock, everything shut down, it was really sleepy, but they had coffin stores that were open 24 hours a day, right? And they were... Mm -hmm expanding the cemeteries. And I say that not to be morbid, but to kind of give you an idea of the scale of the structural violence that was really impacting this population of people. And it really made me think about the power that work has over our lives and the fact that the workplace can be a place of opportunity or it can be a place of really great harm. And in that situation, these workers were really sacrificing their lives, going into the fields, dying in their 30s and 40s, sending their kids into the fields and their teens who were then dying and leaving behind babies. You know, it was just generational violence in the name of survival. Um, and so, you know, it really made me start thinking about the nature of work, the, the idea of, of workplace as this place of opportunity and harm. And, and that sort of is what led to the creation of Ready Set. And it really just became apparent in that journey that the question, the problem, particularly back then, which is 2015, it wasn't that long ago, but it feels like forever ago when you think about it. <laughs> was, you know, like the, the DEI to me was like the question of our future, like who gets access to high opportunity employment, yeah. how people are treated at work, the kind of physical psychological impacts it has, like it just seems like that was the ripple effect. So that's the official story. And then I'm going to tell, tell the unofficial story incredibly quickly. So because I, I, you know, we want to times is really important. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, the unofficial story is just I was in a really toxic work environment myself. So I'm like going in and be like, I'm going to help all these workers. And meanwhile, I'm an environment that's sexist, that's racist, that's mm -hmm. abusive. I'm covering up for a leader that is acting egregiously. And mm -hmm you know, having my own traumas related to that and having these, these crisis with my feelings of self-worth and it was trickling down in my relationships. And I finally just had this moment where I was like, I'm going to take my power back. Like, I'm never going to let someone do this to me or be in a position of power over me mm -hmm. like this again. And like, I'm mindful that in this group right now, it's just so great. It, it, I don't want to presume anyone's gender, but it, it looks like we're all women here. And, you know, I just, I'm sure that so many of us have been in that position in the workplace where we've really had to be at the whims of somebody who was sexist and toxic and, 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 and didn't really know what to do about it except to leave. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think, you know, I can, I can speak for myself too. I've certainly been in situations where I've been in that, that, that position. And I think, you know, you've talked about two really, two really severe extreme cases, one where it's affecting, you know, a whole race of people and another one where it's affecting you personally. And I think if we look at both of those areas, it's, 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 it's systemic. 
It's across, mm -hmm. it's across the whole board. It's across your country, my country. It's across another country where you've worked in. I've worked in multiple countries and it's across all of there too. Mm -hmm. So the question that I kind of have and it's really sits, sits deeply within me is how do we get people to understand about inequity when they haven't had an experience like this or they mm -hmm. haven't heard that story, they haven't, had, they haven't understood that narrative. And this is the thing that we sort of kind of grapple with, I think, at the moment here in Aotearoa and in your country, in the USA. How do we un how do we get people to hear that story when they don't want to listen or they haven't had that experience? Because we all understand that, or people who have experienced and have that understanding. You and I are both working really hard in this space. How do you how do you you know we've both got ways of doing it? What's your way of doing that, Ivan? What's your sort of methodology or practice? I don't know if I figured it out yet. I think. <laughs> I, I, I try though to lead with empathy because I think to your point uh, and what I've what I've experienced quite often is that everybody's experienced or almost everybody has experienced a feeling of inequality or lack of access because of their identity or factors that are out of their control. Mm -hmm. It's not that 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 the that the major we live in an unequal world, yeah. right? So it's not like the majority of the world hasn't had that experience, whether it's on the base of class nationality, gender, disability, mm -hmm. age. There are just so many markers of identity mm -hmm. that are part that are put into a hierarchy. I think that mm -hmm. what happens so often in my work is that people hear DEI and they just the, yeah. the blinds go up, the silo yeah. happens. Yeah. It's like that's them, that's not me. Or yeah. that's just this little piece of a thing mm -hmm. and it's not the whole question of inequality. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember listening to this podcast and I, I will take my data anecdote suggestions anywhere where I can get them. And on this day, I took it from NPR, but I was listening to this podcast where they were talking about building empathy across Israeli and Pal the Israeli and Palestinian lines. And they were saying that when they told the story, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to, how to put this right. When they told the story of another group's oppression it was it was harder for people to kind of identify with that group but when they tied it to personal oppression all of a sudden it became easier and so in my work yeah I really try to get people to first take down whatever those barriers are when they hear DEI you know that's like just so much baggage I'm just like okay like I will say up front, like, what are your fears about this conversation? What do you think this conversation's about? What do you want to get out of this conversation? Like, how do we remove some of that defensiveness that this is not about me to get you into a place to understand it is about you, right? Mm -hmm. And then how, and then for me, it's like, how do we open up and tell a story that feels personal and universal? And then how do we take the idea of shame and penalty out of it, because that's where the defensiveness comes from, right? Is this idea like, okay, people are going to say, because I have white privilege, that mm -hmm. it's my fault, and then I'm going to have to be defensive because I'm going to defend my whiteness, or I'm going to defend my maleness, or I'm going to defend my able-bodiedness, because I feel like that part of my identity is under attack. So for me, it's like a combination of those things. It's like building that empathy. It's about coming from a place of shared experience and not shame. It's yeah. about really figuring out how to get the person to tie the experience of somebody who they assume is an other to their yeah. own experience. And it's a work in progress. And I think something that's really important to note about this, and I want to hear how you do it too, because let me tell you, I've got my notes <laughs> right here. But I think what's what 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 what's really difficult about this is that there's a fluidity there I found in the work. So you can get a person to identify in a room. I, in the US in 2020, we got a whole group of people. And I think you could write a dissertation on the intersection of COVID and Black Lives Matter and 2020 and, and why people were so moved when they were. But I think it's the, some of the same factors at play, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but but that 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 doesn't last, right? And so it's, I think the question is also how do you continue to get somebody to continue to identify, to yeah. always kind of want to break down those barriers that they've been mm -hmm. indoctrinated that exist, right? Yeah. The instinct is always to kind of confront the discomfort. And I feel like that's where the real challenge lies. But I, I am interested to hear from you yeah. how you approach it in your work. Yeah, well, in, in my work, I think, Wyvon, it's about going right back to um, 
the, the sort of four key elements of education for me because as, as in my world I spend a lot of time in education and through all of all of my learnings I think what it boils down to is sort of four key outcomes about how we think about ourselves and how we learn mm -hmm. and the first one is around self-understanding knowing who we are how we fit into the world and then how we take action and how we can contribute that back to humanity planet and prosperity and I think that starts and stems from do we have a good understanding about self and when we know who we are, then we can actually take action from the base of who we are. And I think a lot of the time our education systems don't, don't spend time on focusing on that. What they do is they spend time on the acquisition of knowledge, and that knowledge is often static. And that knowledge that is static doesn't do us justice anymore because we now know knowledge is, is, is available anywhere. So from my perspective, it's let's spend that time with our children and our young people and everybody now, because we've let a whole generation go by where we've talked about standardized knowledge as being the key to being successful, to really go back and remember who are we? Who are we as a human being? And how do we fit into our world around us? And then how do then we take that knowledge and take that knowledge of ourselves and then figure out how can we can then contribute back to humanity? So that's the first sort of area that we focus on, get knowledge about yourself, your family, your whanau, your, your, where you come from and where you're going. Second one is around connection. How do we connect to our, our self, our purpose for being alive, our reason for being here? Um, how do we connect to our land, our, our whenua, our, our, our community, our, our sort of slowly moving further out into the world? And then what we're going to do with our connections. So if we don't know how to connect to each other, then we're really challenged. And I take that from the example, you know, as a Harvard graduate, you'll know you've got connections everywhere. As somebody from a small community, your best way of surviving is, is through connection. Then the next piece around that is around knowledge. What knowledge do you need as an individual to be successful in this world? And so, and I talk about that when I'm working with school systems, that's the curriculum that we're talking about there. And for many countries, that's been standardized. Now, I challenge people who, who have twins in their family or siblings, how dare they treat anyone the same? They would never dare do it. But yet we go to schools and we say, this is the knowledge every single person needs to learn. And I just say, well, that's not true because I don't know any people who want to learn the same exact same stuff. And for too long, we have overprivileged certain sorts of knowledge and certain professions. Now that's gone. We learned through COVID that there were certain, profession, certain jobs and roles that we needed more than the profession professions. So what we've finally understood is that humans are more important and then now we've got the addition of AI, we're starting to see that the white collar jobs are going. So that's something that we're really starting to understand now, that what knowledge is needed for each individual person. And then the final outcome I sort of work with is around um, our competencies. Can we be a critical thinker? Do we know what's true or not? Have we got the right understandings about what is true, what's not? Can we collaborate? Are we taught teaching kids how to collaborate with this new knowledge of self-understanding connection? Can we communicate? Can we collaborate? Can we critically think? Can we be creative and innovative with our ways of working? And so I put all of those sort of four outcomes together. And then at the moment, I'm working globally with some other sort of education thought leaders on thinking about a global curriculum and sort of looking at Gutierrez's four outcomes from the um, UN, which he presented last year in 2022 in September. And he talked about learning to be, learning to do, learning to live with each other, those kinds of outcomes for education, which are the most important now. So we're moving away from that content-based knowledge base only to a much broader set of outcomes that enable children to know who they are so they can actually fit into the world together. And I think in education from that K-12 area, or in New Zealand we call it the schooling sector, we have a huge responsibility to shift away from the the token content areas and just saying that that's life is siloed because it's not. And I think so I'm really excited about the push to move into this, this whole child. And I'm not saying whole child is fluffy, buffy, woo woo. I'm saying this is a deliberate move to say academics plus well-being really matters. Otherwise, we're not going to survive. And I say it's too late to turn back. We have to keep going and really push into that whole space of using, and I talk about it, it's using Indigenous wisdom as well. It's really taking that knowledge of who are we and moving that forward into the world. So I'm very passionate about that. And I talk about it as contributive learning and saying we need to contribute with each other and finding out who we are and using our own skills 
and being so celebratory about each one of us because when we celebrate what we can give, then we are successful because you're different from me, I'm different from you, you're giving what you can, I give what I can, and then together we create the whole. You know, that's amazing. And I want to like pause. I want to like sit in this for a second. And I know you're you're doing the interviewing, Jojo, but there's something that you just said that um, that brought up something for me because the those kind of four categories you lay out, talking about identity, talking about connection and thinking about that as sort of the foundation of the methodology for learning, it, you know, it aligns a lot with sort of how we think about um precursors to structural change and, mm. and 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 so in my book i talk a lot about what is the process um my book is called how to how to talk to your boss about race and that is essentially it's premised on the idea of how do you get yourself ready to have a conversation about race in the workplace but what it is also is kind of a trojan horse for social change for structural change mm-hmm. how do you as one person think about changing a culture changing an environment and the framework that i lay out in the book is like first you have to understand yourself so that's that aligns with the identity piece that you're talking about right 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 yeah right and then Second, you have to understand like where you are in the structure, the social structure of your workplace, and yeah. also who your friends are within the mm-hmm. workplace, who your mm-hmm. allies are, who your accomplices are, who mm-hmm. you can strategically engage a- in, and then also who you want to target in this work. But then finally, it's like also you have to understand what you're actually, what you're talking about, right? You have to understand the experience of others, whether it's as an ally or whether it's a marginalized yeah. person yourself. You have to understand whatever things that you may be missing because you're of your privileges and your experience. And only then can you approach a conversation and only then can you think about setting the stage for structural change. And so I think that's really interesting because it also brings up a question for me is like, learning to what, right? When we're talking about these this this approach and marrying the knowledge, the self-knowledge and the well-being and what we want to position learners to do. After you just said that, I was like, you know, that actually that is a line because we want people who are learning to make a positive impact on humanity, who are learning to change the world. And I think that's one of the reasons why those methodologies align because that's the knowledge you need to do those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I sort of talk a little bit about it. I've on about how, you know, before we sort of there was a static pathway, and you'd go and you'd learn this knowledge, and you'd go off and do do what you were, you know, you would follow a recipe. Whereas now there is no recipe. There is no recipe for the future of this world that we live in. We have to be innovative and creative to create new solutions every day of our life. And so what we have to help help our, our people to do is to, to use that knowledge to create the new. And I talk about when people say, oh, contribution, well, how do kids know what to do? Or how do adults know what to do? It's like they have to, they have, we have to help them learn the processes of figuring that out. And I talk about contribution as just being able to even smile at somebody might be enough or save the oceans. But everybody can because we're sitting on a $35 trillion mental health bill by 2030 if we don't change our behaviours. And we are in serious trouble around this. And, and, and workplace is huge because that is, as you said, right at the very beginning, that makes or breaks so many of us. And it, 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 the repercussions flow back into our family, whānau life, into society, into the sense of feeling um, inadequate and not worthy. All of those things start to come from that. Whereas if we have a strong sense of identity and that can be helped through our work, through what we can contribute, through our being, then we have a much, much stronger society that enables everybody to feel like they have some value and they can offer something to it to our world. And I think that, you know, where the, where the, you know, we talk about structural racism, we talk about structural who holds the power. And that that can that can be that can be spread out if people all have an understanding of what they are contributing and they feel good about what they're doing, they don't get pushed over. You know, you can't be pushed over when you know who you are and you know what you're contributing. So is there sort of some sort of, you know, with the data that you've been collecting through your work, do you see any shifts happening through your work? Have you been able to see some sort of successful examples? Have there been some 
some exciting patterns changing for you or some things that have been moving? Yeah, I think I, I think in the US, yes and no, right? In the US, it's tricky because um, in one sense, there have been some exciting things, but we're also in the middle of a backlash, right? So when I started Ready, Set, you know, I started and people were afraid to say the word race, like just that word, not racism, not like they would be like, we want to talk about, they would call me up because all of our business inbound, they would call me up and they'd be like, why Vaughn? And, and I would be like, yes, because I would, I answered the phone back then because it was just me. And they would be like, <laughs> you know, we are so excited. Like we cannot wait to have you. We want to just really dig in. We want to talk about unconscious bias. We want to talk about gender. We want to talk about class. We want to talk about age. And then, and then they would be like, and you know, we're race. And they would like kind of like skate past it. And I was just like, I was like, wow, like you can't even say the word. And like in the US, especially, like it's a foundational organizational or you know, like principle of our society is mm. from where you were able to buy a home to like whether you were able to open a bank account to where you went to school to mm -hmm. Like all like for a very long time determined by what race you are, you know, and and I think today that's really changed, right? You know, there has been a little bit of a rollback since 2020 in terms of like people's appetite to talk about structural racism, whatever. But that's the the, the genie's not back in the bottle on that one, right? Like people people now know they can't unknow, yeah. For example, that structural racism exists, mm -hmm. they can't unknow how toxic some of these workplaces are they mm. can't unknow me too you know it just in the the way the same way they can't unknow like the impact of being able to work remotely for some of them yeah. right like and 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 what it, and the inequities that just are involved with walking into the office mm. you know so i think in that in that way the conversations move forward a lot Mm. really interesting but in the same way you know all of these things that we're talking about are like precursors for curious global citizens who are prepared to make a change are some of the very things that we're seeing political rollbacks on like the idea that you would not be able to talk about your identity in the classroom mm. learn mm. a history related mm. to that right the idea that identity is itself political mm. as opposed to something that is personal and so therefore must be in order to depoliticize we must do the very thing that Jojo you were saying like we can't do which is like everybody gets the same baseline sterile kind of learning thing that is going to be inoffensive mm. to which is just not the way learning yes. works learning yeah. is provocative learning yeah. pushes yeah. you so if it's yeah. good, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I say that because we see it's. I I think we're very much at an inflection point, and those people who don't want things to change are really pushing back against that kind of education we're talking about, both yeah. in schools and in the workplace. Yeah. And and we see we see you know I do a lot of work obviously with schools in the US as well as here in Aotearoa New Zealand and in other countries around the world Australia, and we're we're noticing that there are there are people are voting are voting with their feet, people are leaving the education system in droves because they're not satisfied with what they're getting, and especially at the high school age because they can see they've got access to other ways of learning, other ways of being, and that's going to really shift what happens in the workforce too. So I think, you know, one of the things I'm interested in is what did you notice when you came to Aotearoa, New Zealand? Did you see um, any similarities, any differences with the cultural identity here? Because we pride ourselves in Aotearoa on, on being, you know, working hard towards moving to um, much more of an equitable outcomes for our people. Did you, what did you notice? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I always hesitate to try to sum up a, um, you know, a culture or a country if I've just been there for a little while. So ask me this question again in December. Yeah. I think my answer may change, but you know, I, I did feel like there, it, it, there was an intentionality there and a knowledge about history, particularly, I think, you know, the dynamics are different just because the historical contexts are different. But when I think about sort of the relationship to the Maori and then the the question of indigenous rights and access I mean like 
it's just a different world mm. than it is in the U.S. I think, you know, in the U.S., m many of our indigenous peoples were eradicated. And, um, you know, there's, even though we do land acknowledgements, I think there's very little consciousness around what was really lost and around sort of privileging those and, and lifting up those of that background. I think our traditional notions of civil rights activism come from um, the descendants of the ins of people who were enslaved, my, you know, yeah, yeah. and and so that means that it takes a very um, well, not a very different flavor, but it takes a different flavor. What I will will say about this is, I think that there's still some similar challenges. That being said, you know, there's still mm -hmm. challenges of economic access and opportunity and participation. There's still challenges around shared power. Mm -hmm. um, there's still challenges around integration versus segregation versus assimilation and what that all looks like. And I, and um, yeah, I think as we get into a sort of era where we have the realities of living with COVID, where we have the realities of living with climate change, where we have resource constraints, you know, the questions that pluralistic societies are dealing with, I think are going to continue to be, or are actually going to increase in severity. And I think you can kind of see those trends in New Zealand as well as in the yeah. U.S. too. Yeah. Um, so th th those would be the overlaps that I have noticed. And the final thing I say, and then I want to hear, wait, because you actively work in both countries, I would love to hear your perspective. But I think in, in terms of the workplaces, which, 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 I, which I know best, I definitely like you know, I always say in the workplace, the histories may be different, but the outcomes are still the same, right? The, you yeah. still see, like, you know, the boards look a certain way, right? The people who make the most money look a certain way. Mm -hmm. The places where the their economic centers are concentrated look mm -hmm. a certain way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. like, like, you know, you, you see differences in pay, you see pay disparities, you see differences yeah. in Yes. equitable treatment, you see differences in access to power, like all yes. of those things we share. Yes. So I'll end by by saying that I'm curious to hear your perspective though. Yeah, I think I would probably agree with just about everything you've said. I think there's nothing I would, I would disagree with. I think we just have a smaller scale here. And I think because we do have the uh, Te Tiriti Waitangi, we have the we have a treaty here that actually en enables us to have a better uh, arrangement between um, ourselves as Maori and, and Pakeha that makes it that we have, we have there has to be some honouring of that. Um, and then I think what, what I do notice here is that we've got a, a chance to, um, we've had reparations, we've had sort of things like that that has not occurred in the US yet. I say yet, with, with every hope in the world yet. Um, but I think what, what I do think is that we, we still have, we still have um, lesser outcomes for Māori. We still have, um, as you say, the same sort of, same sort of challenges as, as getting the people into the spaces, the same sort of business issues, et cetera. But I think there's a real attempt at making um, change and we've got, we've got processes and people in place to are really trying to make a really big difference. And I see a huge attempt at that. Um, I, you know, one example I can give is that, you know, I work heavily in the education system and, and I noticed that, that, you know, when, when um, we've got a, when I look at the Kura results, which are the schools that are led by Māori, designed by Māori for Māori, um, our leaving data and our, our student achievement data shows that in those results, they are perform, outperforming our regular school system. So the last 10 years of data shows that, 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 that they are doing better than any other, in, you know, the average of any other student in the school. So we're seeing huge results. So we, we know what to do. We know how to make better outcomes. So it's there's, there's, there's results that are really exciting and, and, and fantastic to see. But then there are still the challenges of our students who are in the, um, in the regular, school, regular school system that are still struggling. So there's, the disparity is still there. But I think that there is opportunity to show that that actually when we do do things differently, it does make that difference. So it's a matter of how do we get that to every child. And then the other thing I think is that we we can play a little bit of lip service to using some of the amazing, amazing knowledge of Indigenous. And we put that into some of our policies, but we don't know how to enact it. And we don't know how to use that rich knowledge yet. And that's one of the things I'm doing a lot of work in at the moment, just trying to figure out how do we, how do we use that knowledge in the best way possible. So there's lots of 
lots of ways that I think, you know, I'm really proud of Aotearoa because of what they're doing in the space and what we're doing to create change. But there's still a long way to go for all of us across the whole world and living together, learning to live together, to utilise all sets of knowledge that we have so that we can have that connection. And I think the way that I see us getting there is so that we each know ourselves well enough to be able to connect better so that we can get the outcomes that we want. But there's still a lot of pain there from, from for, for people all over the world to be able to get to that point. And there's still going to be a lot of giving up of power. And that's one of the hardest things I think of all is are we prepared to give up some of our power in different places around the world? And that's the toughest question of all. And, and that's going to be the question, can, can people do that? And that's, you know, that's the, that's the tough one. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, and that question is so cutting. I, I frankly, I think it, that question is about equity. Can we give up our power so that we can have more shared power? Yeah. But I think it's also a question about just thinking about the way the world is currently structured and how it's so fundamentally extractive. Yeah. And if we look at, you know, again, at climate, because I know like so, so many of us here are passionate about um, you know, fighting climate change. And that is fundamentally a question of shared power and resources and yeah. what, you know, and I think if we're, if we want to create a better future, yeah. understand how do we redistribute that power is such a fundamental question. Um, yeah. Say. And, and I, I don't believe that it's a, it's the, it's a zero sum game. I think yeah. the, the thing that I sort of think about is that there's enough for everybody in the world. And it's a matter of how do we, how do we do, and I'm not trying to be a Pollyanna here, I'm actually thinking that there is actually enough. There is, yeah. And I've seen that through the work I've done through education, that when actually we are equitable in our outcomes, we can, in our ways of delivering, we can get better outcomes for everybody. And, you know, the, the ways that we've worked with different different systems, we've seen everybody lift, not just, you know, we, we have, you know, and I think that's the piece that I really would love to be able to get others to sort of dig into and figure that out with us, because I think that's the thing that, and you will have seen that too, when you've done your work and, and, and you know, when everybody starts to dig into this and actually figure it out, they can actually see that it's a win-win for everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone, mm -hmm. everyone gets a better life out of this. So I think that's the thing that I find really fascinating. You know, I think one of the things that, that we kind of touched on when we talked before this, this session, my one was around having difficult conversations. Um, you know, and and that's that's one of the things that I think you and I have, have no problem probably doing um, because we've, we've, we've been used to it and ha our lives have probably been full of it. Um, uh, that's probably why we are where we are today. But it's sort of like, how do we, how, how do you, what's some, some ways that you've been able to help people to do that? I know one of the ways I have is to be able to actually describe what success looks like in a different way. And that's part of my sort of helping people understand that evidence doesn't look the same for everybody. And my example for that is like when I'm teaching um, or about, you know, science or something like that, I'll give you a quick example, is that, um, you know, people, if, if, I'm, if I'm in my sort of wahini toa form, I'll go down to the river and I'll listen to what birds there are or whether there are eels in the river and I'll, and I'll say, I know what's wrong with the water because there are certain birds aren't there or the eels aren't there. If I was had my Pakeha hat on, I'd go down to the river and I'd take a test tube of water and I'd take it back to this, the, the, the um, you know, um, lab and I'd check it and I'd find out what was wrong with the water and I'd know something was wrong with the water then. So both of those are evidence of what's and then one of you know what we've been doing for a long time is we've been over privileging the test tube way but actually my Maori way is just as is just as um, right right and so what what I've been trying to help people understand that there are multiple ways of knowing things there are multiple ways of evidence there are multiple sources of knowledge but what we've been doing is over privileging for too long certain ways of knowing and that's been as far as I talk about assessment that's stopped a lot of our kids knowing um, a lot of our kids who who have other ways of knowing things being able to be successful do you have any sort of examples like that of, of sort of how we're trying to teach people in different ways to accept others knowledge as valid yeah, I think it's, I, I think that's a really interesting example. And it, um, for me, it kind of reminds me of this question, the idea of a goal and like whose goal and who do we center, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and under, and underneath what you're saying, I hear you saying, you know, centering certain types of knowledge, certain types for me, it's centering certain types of experiences. Like mm -hmm. I also don't necessarily know, um, 
when it comes to experience and humanity, if there is one universal truth, what we tend to do is default to a dominant narrative around what's healthy, what is positive, what is uh, impactful um, in a way that reinforces uh, inequality and unequal paradigms, right? So, you know, to what you're saying, my question is always, well, how do we center the marginalized? How do we center marginalized knowledge around the health of something that's external, like the river that you're talking about, but also like the health of something like an organization or the experience of their fellow workers? You know, in my experience, you can talk to uh, two different people in an office, you know, you can talk to, and I'm not going to stigmatize, yeah. not all white guys, hashtag not all white guys, but you can talk to like a white guy in office and his experience is going to be very different, right? Yeah. Somebody who looks like yeah. me, you know, yeah. and you can yeah. talk to somebody who's straight, his experience yeah. is going to be very different from a queer person, someone yeah. who's cis experience yeah. is going to be very different from a trans person. So like, to what you're saying, I think when we go into organizations, we're trying to figure out what's going on and where the challenges within that organization mm-hmm. lie, and that organization's impact on society at large may be. And mm-hmm. I think to get to that truth, we often have to unpack a multiplicity of truths yeah. and make sure that we're not just centering what historically has been the default. Yeah. truth right yeah. and we're making sure that we bring in the perspectives of the marginalized I think that's one layer to it another layer and I don't I will I can get like I don't want to get super philosophical because I can get in the weeds all day and then you're gonna have to like pull me back but <laughs> I think there's, there's a very real question around in my work the role that companies and organizations should play you know I think that the idea of having a society where being a billionaire is like a thing that exists is fundamentally opposed to being a society that is sustainable, where resources are fairly distributed and and, Mm -hmm. and we're not extracting, um, you know, in in a toxic way from our client and our our climate and our people, you know, and I think that there's a real question also when you talk to different people from different cultures and different experiences in the workplace. Like, what is it? Is it grow or die? Is it extract, extract, extract at all costs? Is it, you know, flood a market so that you, you know, you destroy all the competition and then you're the winner and you get to Mm -hmm. save the day? Is it, you know, how is it, you know, is it the sort of let's all be unicorns kind of ideology or Mm -hmm. should we in our corporate lives and our, corporate spaces be going towards something that's more sustainable because we can, you know, and I talked about this at, you know, the welcome weekend, we can be interpersonal around our activism and our contributions all day, but at a corporate level, if we're, if we don't think about the impact that business has on society, then we're never going to solve these problems that we have, whether it's economic inequality or policing or access to education or the climate, a lot of those are also complicated by corporate interests, right? And I think there's there are different ways of imagining corporate citizenship, the relationship of the company to the society, what the workplace actually is and actually does that also align to cultural experience. And, and I think equal to and more almost more importantly, the experience of being the group that is extracted from, the experience of being a group that is going to be exploited, the experience of being, you know, that that's part of capitalism, right? The, the group yeah. that's on the bottom, right? I yeah. think, and I think that that has something to tell us as yeah. well. That's what I found in my work. Yeah, no, that's that's such a valid point. And I think that, that that's worth, um, I think that's why this team around um, with the EHF team has got a lot to, a lot to contribute. And um, I think that that's, that's a really a good place for us to just take a little bit of a pause and see if the, any of this wonderful team around us have any questions before we continue on. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question of Wyvon in particular? Or Jojo. Well, <laughs> go, Rosalie. Sorry, because this, this has been, um, this is a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you. Look, I wanted to go back Um, one of the points that both of you have made is the beginning point being about knowing ourselves. 
And I just wonder, I'd love to get your thoughts about the journey, given that often our perception of ourselves has been shaped by um, a school system, a parental system, a workplace system that is actually saying you should be this. These are your weaknesses and you should be better at, you should be more than that often creates this real sense of imposter syndrome and people that are, are going through their life. And this is just from a female perspective, let alone a, a disability or a race or <laughs> you know any, any other perspective. But there's always sense of perhaps not being misfit. And I just wonder that process of how do we help people to find and know their tūranga waiwai, where they stand, where they are strong, where that they are beautiful and whole and who they are outside of this very mechanistic performance mindset that's been inculcated in our systems. I, I, I can take a first stab at this. I, I write about this, Rosalie, a little bit in my book, right? I talk about my journey to my identity and um, how particularly as it relates to my racial identity, you know, I, I write in the book, I don't know what being Black means, right? I know what people tell me I'm supposed to be like. I know how it sort of shaped my experience in the outside world. But what it really means for me from an innate perspective, it's almost impossible to say, right? Because it is so dependent on those perceptions. And I think that gets to a broader point, which is that a lot of these identities that we have are socially constructed. Mm -hmm. Female versus male, black versus white, it, you know, indigenous versus foreign. Like there are these sort of categories, social categories that we put people in to determine in group versus out group, right? And I think from my experience, it's important to understand these categories which of the categories quarries, like we belong to and what they may have meant for our upbringing and the messages that we mm -hmm. received and what the kinds of experience that we may miss from other people. But in terms of your own internal self-worth, in terms of your own sort of guiding principles, you know, I think that, um, that is in in some ways, while it may be shaped by your identity and your culture, it does sit apart from it a little bit, right? And it's like, I, you know, I, all I say in my book, I don't know how to tell you to know yourself, but like, you know, it's helpful to go to therapy. It's helpful to have a support system. It's helpful to like in, you know, have those people that will engage you on the individual level. And but I think when we are learning to change. I talk about the role I, of identity in that being able to identify those messages, the, the, the ones that you've just laid out, being mm -hmm. able to understand the biases that are inherent in those, being able to understand what we may be replicating, what we may be missing, et cetera. And that can tell, that can also tell us a little bit about who we, who we are, but that's sort of how I think about positioning those questions because, and I'll, I'll stop here. I think you could almost go insane a little bit, and I don't want to use ableist language here, but you could really kind of just spin yourself up in a circle saying, who am I? Who am I not? Is mm -hmm. this the, is this the black me? Is this the indigenous me? Is this the female me? Is this the upper class me, the lower class me, the middle class me? Like who, you know, at some point who, who knows you, you know, you're going to be you. And I think just identifying those influences uh, you know, can be, can be helpful to focus on. But Jojo, I'm curious to hear from you. Yeah, thanks. And, and that's, that's a really good question and a good answer why I want to, because it's, I mean, for me, it was um, understanding who I am as a, first of all, a female, um, as an educator, and then, as, and later understanding who I am as a Māori woman too, because that was taken away, as you, most of you know, that was taken away from me as a youngster. And um, I wasn't allowed to learn about my māori even mm -hmm. though I was brought up as a Māori. It just wasn't labelled as a Māori because my, my mother was so Māori in her, her way of being. Um, and so, but what I've done is a lot of work in the space and tried to figure out how to help kids remember who they are mm. and also mm. adults as teachers. So I've done, my, most of my work has been in education. And so I, I think, how do we help teachers remember who they are? Because I talk about the dissonance that's sitting inside them about being doing things that they know are not right. 
but they're doing things because they have to because they have to pay a mortgage and that's about yeah. the workplace stuff so I, I i've written a tool that helps people to to do that and it sort of focuses on on like understanding how i fit in the world who i am as a person what are my goals my aspirations and my potential for success and i'm happy to share this with everyone because it's a public one and it talks about sort of four dimensions across in a, in a progression of understanding and the, the first one's about where am i from what's my place you know what's what's my time period what's my whanau who and where do i stand on my whenua and the best that, that, you know, if you could talk across a progression of time, the outcome for that is being able to stand tall and say, I know my story, the story of my whenua, my whanau, and how my experiences have made me who I am. I know why I matter and why I matter to other, when my other people matter to me, and I'm proud of our history, who we are and where we're going. And that's that first sort of section. The second one's around my identity, my languages, my culture, my interests and my feelings. And that sort of comes up to the, the outcome of that is, you know, and there's a progression of things across there. And that's where we sort of, that's kind of where I talked about that sort of knowing what evidence means to different people. But the outcome of that is, you know, when I'm asked, I can describe in detail what makes me me. So I know and, and we sort of work with this across the whole schooling period and with the adults too. But it's sort of like I know how to nurture my own identity and others' identities. So I'm not frightened mm. to be me and I'm not frightened about other people's identities. And I know what matters to me and my whanau. And then the next one's around sort of my purpose. I know what my pursuit, I know what my pursuits are, I know what my goals, my aspirations, and how I can contribute. And that sort of outcome for that is like I know the unique ways I can contribute. I'm confident about how to live my life. Every day my actions make the world a better place for myself, my final friends, and community in Fenua. And the last one's around capacity, potential intuition and bravery and belief. So like I can use my, I've got the courage to take action and make decisions to improve my life and others' lives. And I believe that my hopes and dreams will come true and that I have, know I have what it takes to succeed in the ways I want to. And that's, you know, it starts off at a, it starts off with, first of all, that sort of concept around myself first. And then I move into how do I fit in the world around me? And then I go into the space of how do I go out and take action into the world? And it's kind of, it's kind of a, you know, and, and it, I use this as an adult, like when I'm struggling with learning something new, how do I fit my identity into this new stuff? Or, you know, and, you know, I'm nearly 60 now. So it's sort of like I go backwards and forwards as an adult going back to this tool to help me remember that, you know, when I'm faced with something challenging, there's a new piece of my identity that might be challenged with this. So how do I figure that out? And then I might use this and say to somebody, well, how do you see me in this space? And get some evidence and some you know, feedback or feed forward around that. So it's like, you know, I'm really, I'm really conscious that if we don't have something to hold us and help us mm -hmm. to move forward, it's really, we do float, we do flop around, we do go all over the place and turn into jelly. It's kind of hard. It's really challenging. So that's why I've spent so long figuring out what is a simple way of describing what it might look like. But for me, it's very different than it would look like for Wyvon because mm -hmm. your life experiences are different, but neither one of us are right or wrong. We just yeah. are ourselves. I think there's something also, first of all, like Jojo, like that, I would love to see that tool because I think that's such a beautiful just process that you've just laid out. And I'm so happy that you like, you shared that with us. But I, I also think hearing what you said and Rosalie thinking about what was underneath your question too, is like, how do I know who I am versus others' perceptions of me. And I do mm -hmm. wonder if maybe there's some middle ground where, you know, yes, perception of other people is informed by bias and therefore we must engage that from a critical way. But it can also tell us something, you know, like yeah. depending yeah. on who's doing the perceiving and just thinking about how we, how that has affected the way we navigate the world in general, I think something that 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 I talk about in my book also is the idea of social location. And so not just our identity, but then to kind of to what you're saying, Jojo, is, is our relationship of our identity to a position in a given place and time, and then how that affects the way we interact with others and the power we may have in that moment and the power that we may not have and what we may see versus what we may not See, I, you know, I think that there is something that can be helpful in thinking about external perceptions as well. I just sort of feel, I guess, you know, it's taken, it took me, I don't know, 50 years to get to a point of, of that shift. And I don't think our generation have time. So absolutely love what you spoke to. 
Jojo and how do we inculcate this from such an early mm. stage? It's really, both of you, it's very, very beautiful reflection. Yeah, I, I agree, Rosalie. I, it took me to Lima's in my fifties too, so I don't want I don't want to I don't want other people to have to go through that either. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much. It's a great question. Any other questions? I know we, we, we've got probably three minutes left, so we probably don't have time for any more. Um, but if anyone does have one or have anyone, we could probably take one last one. Mine was a very practical one, Jojo, um, which is you just said that that tool that you described so beautifully just now is a, a public tool. Yes, uh, it is. Yeah. I'd love to know, uh, and I imagine other people watching this later would love to know where they could yeah. find that. So that I think it's on my website, and if it's not, I'll make sure it is. I'll get it there by the end of the day. I think it is because we do send it out to anybody who wants to have a look at it. That's our sort of our freebie for the world. So, um, you, yeah, I'll make sure it's there. It's just um, on the chat, actually, Ting. Yeah, okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I, I think one of the things that um, is really important is just to say that um, Yvonne had said that she's willing to come to Aotearoa and do some work with people in, in our, our lovely little country. So if there's any interest from anybody out there that would like to do that with Yvonne, I would certainly be very interested in that myself. So for my own team. Um, so if there's any, if there's a way that we can get in touch with you, Yvonne, what's the best way to do that? Um, uh, you can find um, our website, which Michelle has put up as well. So thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing these resources. And um, you can email me at wyvon at the So I'll just drop that email um, uh, in the chat right now. And that's the best way to reach me. Yeah. Well, thank It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on um, the session with us today, Wyvon. We absolutely have had so much fun with you. And I'm looking forward to spending some time with you over in the US. And we will welcome you with open arms to Aotearoa anytime you want to come. And I would love to see you over here. And I'm sure all of the team would too. And any of the companies in New Zealand that do decide to have you come and spend some time with them and help them work with you to understand a little bit more about um, DEI, I'm sure they will um, learn so much by doing that with you. So thank you so much. It's been an absolute honour and a privilege and a pleasure. So thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you to our team and our audience. It's been an absolute honour to have you with us as well. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.